Cool. Fantastic. All right. Well, um, happy Tuesday, everybody. Welcome to um, the penultimate uh, APG Salt Basins uh, technical webinar for this season. Um, joining us today, we have uh, Dr. Alexandros Danilidis, uh, joining us from TU Delft. A little bit about Dr. Alexandros. He is a, a postdoctoral researcher affiliated with the University of Geneva and TU Delft. Um, he will start his new position as an assistant professor of geothermal engineering at TU Delft on uh, December 1st, 2021. Congratulations, Alexandros. Thanks. Um, he obtained his PhD at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands, where he looked at the energy uh, and economic analysis of geothermal systems for heat production. Uh, he specializes in the field of the development and uncertainty uh, quantification of combined surface and subsurface uh, uncertainties and direct use of geothermal systems. Um, and his recent interests include using uh, reservoir simulations to study uh, the interference between subsurface activities, as well as the hydraulic impact of faults and their properties on geothermal energy production uh, in different geological settings. So without further ado, Dr. Alexandros, I hand it over to you. Take it away. Thanks for that lovely introduction and um, good morning, good afternoon and good evening to everybody. Uh, I, I suspect we are joining from all over the world today. Um, so I would like to talk to you about some of the work that I carried out during my PhD at the University of Groningen. Um, and so most of the parts that I will be presenting today are published in this paper that is called Salt Intrusions Providing a New Geothermal Exploration Target for Higher Energy Recovery at Shallower Depths. And to get to that, uh, I thought that it's a good idea to also have a, a bit of an introduction into geothermal energy. Um, it might be a rather long one, but I hope that that helps with uh, contextualizing how we chose to, to um, look into this uh, problem in the first place. So let me just um, start here. So um, the topics that I'm going to cover is a, a short energy outlook. Now we'll discuss a bit on the, the heat transfer in and the classification of geothermal systems, uh, a brief overview of the energy balance in geothermal systems. Then I will make a mention on economics in, the, in conduction dominated geothermal systems, which will bring us to how salt and positive temperature anomalies can play a role in that. And uh, I will conclude with a proof of concept uh, example that we um, worked on on this paper. Um, so uh, the global CO2 emissions, uh, as you can see he here, are historically growing and uh, the division of that is also changing dynamically um, throughout time uh, with um, countries uh, like China and, and India uh, increasing uh, tremendously in terms of their contribution to CO2 emissions. But underlying this, if we look at where the CO2 emissions are uh, rooted in, um, we see that most of them are coming from the use of fossil fuels today. And uh, this, this use is uh, projected to rise uh, in the future, despite the efforts that we have uh, worldwide to, to reduce it. And um, this is exactly the backdrop where geothermal energy uh, is, is placed in. So if we uh, focus a little bit on uh, the EU countries and we look at the primary energy use uh, in the different sectors, we will see that households amount to more than a quarter of that energy use. And of that uh, energy use, more than 65% is actually for space heating. Therefore, it's, it's quite important and there's a very high potential for reducing the CO2 emissions when we talk about um, geothermal energy and how that can contribute to the energy transition. Um, so having said that, um, systems such as the one you see on your right-hand side can be um, very helpful in, in reducing the CO2 emissions. Um, if we look at uh, geothermal energy worldwide, and you see here on the left-hand side, the installed capacity in terms of uh, gigawatts for direct use and for power systems, um, we see that direct use systems have a much higher um, installed capacity, and uh, we will see later in the presentation the reason for that. But when we look at the produced energy, we observe that um, uh, that gap narrows. And that is because uh, systems that produce power typically have a higher capacity factor. So produce more uh, hours throughout the year, simply because the demand uh, is there throughout the year. Whereas for heating, there's a seasonal pattern that needs to be considered. Um, so when we look at an overview of geothermal systems, if we, if we look at it uh, in a bird's eye view, 
uh, we have three main uh, categories, if we can say that, and that is sedimentary aquifers, enhanced geothermal systems, which are typically involved uh, stimulation, and naturally fractured systems. And uh, in this uh, schematic, you can see more or less the, the depths and the temperatures that we expect to encounter in each of these systems. Um, one of the problems for, for geothermal energy development is that unlike uh, petroleum systems, we don't have um, universally um, accepted, let's say, play catalog until at least until recently. So you can split the different types of systems depending on whether you have direct use of heat or power production. You can also discuss uh, the dominant heating heat transfer mechanism, whether it's conduction or convection. And you can also classify them as low enthalpy and high enthalpy. So because um, high enthalpy systems or convection dominated or power production systems have been the ones that are more, more uh, uh, captured the imagination of, of scientists and engineers alike, uh, we tend to, to have to use, adopt their um, uh, way of reasoning. So sometimes you would talk to somebody in Iceland and they would consider a low temperature, low enthalpy, something of 200 degrees. Whereas in the Netherlands, we would be very happy to have uh, that kind of uh, temperature production. Um, so having said that, uh, we need to understand some of the uh, heat transfer mechanisms that apply. The first one is uh, conduction. This is simply the collision of uh, individual atoms or molecules. And uh, this is what we equivalent of cooking in our kitchen uh, we experience by holding the handle that heats up. Um, Another one is uh, advection or convection, depending on how you want to define it. And this is a transfer due to the fluid movement. And this is what happens typically in, in our uh, pot as we cook while it's, uh, while it's boiling. Uh, and the last one is uh, radiation, which is um, a transfer of heat by electromagnetic waves. And this we have, uh, for example, from the heat source emitting uh, outwards. Um, so when we talk about the flux of energy, typically we, in geothermal systems, even though radiation does contribute to that, at least in the, in the deeper parts of the subsurface, we are mostly talking about convection and conduction. And uh, if we take a simple example, like we see here on the right-hand side, uh, where we have a reservoir layer that is um, has an over and under burden and it's confined, and we produce the hot water through that layer and extract the useful heat out of it and re-inject the cool down water back into the reservoir. Um, so while we do that, we have both convection and conduction taking place. Convection in this case is forced because we are actually pumping through the system, whereas conduction is happening naturally um, both between uh, the grains, but also between uh, the fluid. So that brings us to an overview of um, the geothermal system's energy balance, which is this uh, long equation that we see here but we can break that down into individual components. So what we have is essentially the heat that is stored or accumulated in the fluid part, the heat that is stored or accumulated in rock. And then um, we have the heat flow by fluid convection, typically what we, um, what we force with our pumping through the system and also heat flow by conduction in the rock and heat flow by conduction in, in the fluid. So this gives us an overview of uh, how these geothermal systems behave um, and the two um, important heat transfer mechanisms. Uh, using these heat transfer mechanisms, uh, MOOC at, uh, at, in 2014 suggested um, a play catalog for geothermal systems where the separation happens based on the dominant heat transfer mechanism. So we have conduction dominated and convection dominated systems. So conduction dominated systems typically are intracartonic basin types uh, or a basement type. And you can have um, either fault fracture controlled or lethal biophases controlled. And depending, uh, and you have a, a differentiation within those based on these controlling mechanisms. An example of that would be this uh, image here that uh, pretty much resembles also a petroleum system. Maybe some of you are a bit more familiar with that, um, where you basically have a target at depth uh, to which you reach with at least two wells. So you call this a doublet system. You extract the hot water from one of them and you re-inject the cool down water uh, from the other. The other types of systems are the convection dominated systems. And these are more encountered in technologically active um, areas. And you can have either volcanic or extensional domain types as, this, as the two um, uh, end members. And again, 
whether or not you have fault control or magmatic control um, in terms of the source and the, and the heat transfer, you have again a differentiation here. A system like that would be similar to the one that we see in, in Iceland, um, as you see in the image here, where you have um, the fresh water uh, reaching the, the magma intrusion and from there getting heated up and finding its way back to the surface. Um, so you already have a nat natural convection taking place in this system. Typically, this magma intrusion would, would also cause a lot of fracturing around it. Um, so you have a lot of heat exchange uh, taking place there. So if we then try to interpret this in terms of geothermal gradient, we have some characteristic curves of known geothermal sites around the world, which I plot here. Uh, you see Iceland in red, La Terello in Italy, uh, Sunse Forêt in France, and uh, the Dutch average and the world average, which are actually really very close. Uh, so already by the shape of this curve, we, we can have a good understanding about the heat transfer mechanism that is dominant in our, in our study area. So if we think about this in terms of, uh, of heat flux and we look at the tectonic map of the world, again, this is an image from uh, MOOC, and we overlay that with uh, the surface heat flow, we see a very good match in terms of where we have tectonic activity and where we have high surface heat flow. So um, typically, if we are away from uh, tectonic margins, then we expect to have an average of about 75 uh, milliwatts uh, per square meter in terms of heat flow uh, coming to the surface. And again, just uh, emphasizing this, the shape of, of the, the geothermal gradient that we encounter with depth gives us a good indication whether or not we are in a, in a convection or a conduction dominated setting. So in this case, the locations C, E, and, uh, and A1 would be closer to a type one curve, whereas the other ones would be closer to type two curve, uh, meaning that convection is a dominant mechanism. So coming back to our uh, overview, and for the rest of this talk, I will focus mostly on uh, low enthalpy or conduction dominated or direct use of heat um, geothermal systems, because this is related to uh, the main topic of today regarding salt. So what do we have in terms of heat transfer during production? If we look at a very simple example here, where again, we have a, a reservoir layer in the middle from which we produce the hot water and to which we re-inject the cool down water. What happens inside the reservoir is that we have uh, convection and conduction, but we also have conductive recharge from the confining layers uh, above and below that, that reservoir. What also is important to understand also is that after production, um, we still have an impact of a uh, heat transfer. So in this case, in this study by De Brown, um, uh, they identified five different stages. So A is the production phase where you still have no influence in your production temperature because the cold plume has not reached uh, your production temperature. When that happens, you enter phase B where uh, you have a gradual decrease of production temperature until you reach the point C where you probably stop production. And from there on, you have again a conductive recharge taking place and you see that First, it sharply recovers, and after that, you enter this asymptotic phase with uh, a gradual temperature increase that is going back to the initial production, initial temperature of the reservoir. Um, you might wonder why there are no units here on the x-axis, and that is because the timing of this is depending on so many different things. We will come back to that uh, a bit later in the talk. So. If we go back again to conduction and we use uh, Fourier's law to calculate uh, the heat flux, uh, we simplify that for a 2D example. Um, and then we are able to uh, easily calculate uh, what the heat conductivity of each of the layers are based on our temperature profile. So also when we look into the dynamics and here uh, I show a uh, this is actually a synthetic example where we have in the blue, in the red, we produce the, the hot water and in the blue, we re-inject it back. And you see on the left-hand side, a map view at the middle of the reservoir. On the top right, you see a section view through the reservoir and then the same on the bottom right. Um, 
we start, as we re-inject the cold water, we have this cold plume that is expanding. And as we keep doing that, we have this characteristic tear shape shape of the cold plume that is starting to affect the producer well and the volume of affected uh, reservoir uh, in terms of being cooled down is also increasing. And this further expands as we keep on producing. What is important to know is that here on the top right, I have highlighted in green the actual uh, reservoir part. But what we do see is that there is a significant um, cooling taking place also outside of the reservoir, and that is happening due to conduction. So actually, we are taking heat from the, from the confining layers that is recharging uh, the layer from which we are producing. Um, and you can see on the, on the bottom left here how production temperature changes in time in, a, in this uh, simple synthetic example. Now, in reality, we have systems that are much more complicated than that. And in this case, you see a heterogeneous reservoir in the Delft sandstone in the Netherlands and two doublets being, being installed and produced. And you see that the shape of the cold plume is, is nothing like that nice tear shape thing that we saw in the synthetic example where everything was homogeneous, but all these heterogeneities play a role in how the cold plume is distributed uh, in the subsurface. Um, important to know here is that when you simulate a system like that, um, a big difference compared to petroleum systems where uh, typically you would uh, deactivate the cells that don't contribute to flow. So uh, if you have uh, in a heterogeneous reservoir, if you don't have um, the shales, you typically would, you would switch off because they would not contribute to, to your production. But in this case, if you do that, then you're um, significantly underestimating the heat recharge you get from the reservoir. So in these two doublets from the previous example, only using the sandstone leads to a much earlier thermal breakthrough, almost, uh, almost 40 years um, for the doublet on the left-hand side. So it is important to include that. And of course that has a computational burden, but it does make your, your prediction uh, much more accurate. All this is to say that the conduction is happening not only outside, but also inside the reservoir, depending on the type of reservoir that you have. So this brings us already to the heat conductivity of salt. So there are already some studies. This is from Mello et al. in 1995, where they show that the salt is known to have a higher thermal um, conductivity compared to typically other, um, other rocks like sandstones that we consider as reservoirs of limestones, and also compared to shales and, and basalts. And already in that paper, we saw that uh, the salt domes, in, shown here in different shapes, can have uh, a very different um, effect on the distribution of the temperature contours around them. So they do cause um, high thermal anomalies around them. So this was sort of the starting point for us um, when we were looking into this, uh, to this work. Um, some other studies also show, again, this um, increase of the contours around uh, salt bodies due to this uh, high uh, heat conductivity of the salt. And again, also in a synthetic example shown here, that a shape like that would cause an anomaly uh, in, in temperature. So knowing that, and also knowing that, for example, in the Netherlands, uh, geothermal development um, is really challenging economically sometimes. So a big part of the cost for that are related to drilling, as you see on the left-hand side in blue. And on the right-hand side, you see a number of projects and the share of costs in terms of uh, different um, components. You see that drilling is, uh, is really a significant part of that. And drilling is a function of depth. Um, of course, and com geological complexity. Uh, so therefore, the, 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 this um, combining these two ideas that you know this high heat uh, conductivity of salt might actually bring higher temperature closer to the surface. That means that you could maybe reach that higher temperature at a shallower depth and make your uh, development more attractive uh, economically. So this was um, this was the underlying idea behind this work. And uh, again, I show here an example in uh, also through my, for my PhD work uh, where we show um, the expected net present value of a development uh, considering uncertainties both in the subsurface and uh, the economic uh, parameters. And you see that uh, there's a, there is um, 
it's quite possible that you have either a very low or even a negative uh, net present value in the end of uh, about 40 years of production. So with that very long introduction, uh, we set out to, to see does that make sense and uh, to try to work it out in an example. So there was interest in this area in the north of the Netherlands. You see in the inset in the top left here, uh, the Netherlands, and we are actually situated in the north, um, north northwest part in the area where uh, some of you might know the Groningen gas field uh, is um, situated. So the interest was there for geothermal energy, but there was no suitable um, aquifer, sadly, in the area. So the only one was the one used for gas production, and it would not be possible to use that for, for geothermal energy. Therefore, we started looking at what could be a different concept uh, to, to develop geothermal energy there. So we, we acquired a seismic cube that is outlined in the red uh, dots here, and we started working on that. And uh, we identified the major lithostratigraphic units that you see here on the left in the seismic attributes and the instantaneous phase on the right. Um, and from that, we outlined the uh, assault body. So here you see a section that is west-east uh, from that um, uh, area where we had the seismic cubes from. And you can see the, the, the changes in thickness of the different layers and the very thick uh, Zechstein uh, salt layer that is present. So the shape of the, of the dome you can see on the top right, um, you have these two peaks that are connected by a sort of a saddle and um, the thickness of that, uh, you can see in the middle figure, uh, figure, figure C, where it reaches at up to 1200, uh, 1200 meters. And at the base of that, you see also a really good correlation between uh, the faults that are present in the Rutligan basement and um, that probably have triggered the halokinetic effect of uh, forming these domes and um, how their alignment is actually very well connected with the shape of the dome that we have. So we compared this, um, this structure with uh, regional models and we found a very good agreement in terms of what we were able to interpret uh, from, from our data. I have to acknowledge here also that the, the data, all the seismic data that we use for the study were supplied to us by the NUM, that's the operator of uh, the Groningen gas field. So then with this, uh, we set out to, to make a meshing, uh, to mesh this model and, and to make a steady state model for, for the temperature distribution. So um, we use two different types of grids to be able to capture uh, in a more refined way all these variations in thickness that we observe around the top of the dome. That's the figure B here on the right-hand side. And then C where we use just a standard thickness uh, throughout. And as boundary conditions, we'll come back to that later, we use a temperature map that we, that we had at our, at our disposal from um, uh, the, um, the gas field production. So at, at the top of the Red Ligand, we had a temperature map for the whole region. And as a boundary condition at the top, we use uh, the, what we know to be the average temperature in, in that area. So running these steady state models, um, we, we, we made some scenarios. So we, at that time, we made a literature study and we found all these different values for um, the different lithostratigraphic groups. And from these values, we devised uh, these five scenarios where in, in one case, we have uh, the salt layer not actually having this higher conductivity. So that would behave as if the salt was not there or if you had a layer that is, uh, let's say, of typical thermal conductivity, then a minimum um, where all the values are set to minimum, a maximum where all the values are set to max, and a medium, again, based on the, um, on the literature uh, values. And also an extreme scenario where everything is low and only the heat, only the, the salt layer has the highest heat conductivity found in literature. So with this, um, we observe now the temperature distribution at two different locations. I will show them in the map later. And we already see that uh, we have quite high differences depending on, the th on two things. Firstly, the scenario that we're considering. So in this case, the extreme scenario always yields uh, the highest temperature at the top. This is something to be expected. But the differences between uh, the scenarios range up to uh, 25 degrees in this case, we're at the top of the thickest part of the dome. And this difference is actually much lower in parts where the salt thickness is, is lower. What is interesting to note is that a bit later in, in this, during this project, we also were able to acquire this um, 
um, fiber optic temperature measurements from an observation well a bit further away. And uh, if you apply a Fourier's law here, you would find that for an average um, for an average uh, heat flux in that area, you uh, the um, heat conductivity of the salt layer here would be about uh, four uh, watts per meter Kelvin. So a bit, uh, let's say, on, closer to the mid medium scenario that we consider in our analysis. So now, if we take a slice of uh, of the depth a depth slice of, of this uh, resolved temperature field at the top of the dome. And again, you see here the two locations that we just uh, looked at, location one at the thickest part of the dome and location two away from the dome where we have the, 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 the least uh, thickness for the salt. Um, you see, first of all, that between the two grids that we considered, that the differences are actually minimal in 0.5 degrees at best. Uh, so we are confident that uh, both grids are able to capture this um, and resolve these temperature differences. And then for, for all the different scenarios, you see these temperature differences of the medium, minimum temperature at that depth and uh, the maximum. And these differences range from 17 up to 25 degrees uh, of uh, Celsius. I have to say that uh, it's important to keep in mind that in this geological setting, um, your average geothermal gradient is about 30 degrees per kilometer. So having a temperature difference of, of 17 to 25 degrees is, is really quite high. So it would be the equivalent of at least five to 600 meters of, of depth that you would have to drill to um, if that anomaly was not there. So I also put here for reference the, the different um, um, heat conductivity values in, in the study. So if we then look into how the thickness of the salt and results in what kind of temperature difference. So we compare different types of scenarios here, the medium with the, with the not salt one, and then the extreme with the not salt one, and then the max and mean. We, we, we want to understand, and this is a section more or less going north to south, so that we have in one section, the, the lowest and the highest, or almost the highest thickness of the salt. We want to understand at what thickness of the salt do, do we start to see this uh, anomaly being, being uh, prominent. And uh, if you follow the contour lines in, in this plot, you will see that already at about uh, just below 600 meters, you start to observe these temperature uh, anomalies uh, taking place. So that means that when you go, uh, when you're out looking for locations where this um, this um, principle might apply, then already uh, thicknesses of 600 meters might be enough to make a difference. So the next step to this was to actually use a conceptual reservoir model. So because we didn't have one in that, in that location. So we said, okay, what if there is a, a suitable reservoir that is positioned on top of that dome or close to that dome on the flanks here, as you see in the, the white area that is outlined on the, on the plot. And um, we produce from the deeper parts and we re-inject back in the, in the higher parts of the structure. And for that, we tested a few scenarios with a fixed re-injection temperature and different flow rates um, to see uh, what the effect is. And uh, from top to bottom here, we have different uh, heat conductivity scenarios. And from left to right, we have higher flow rates. So what is evident is if you compare the not salt scenario with the extreme one, you have about 40% increase in terms of power. And um, that's about 25 if you compare the not salt to, to the medium scenario. So that's already quite a bit of a, um, uh, of a difference that is uh, significant when you're talking about marginal economic performance of uh, systems being developed in these uh, in this, um, geological areas. Um, the, the shape of the cold plume is not that different, but due to the higher surrounding temperature, you have a bit of a sharper gradient um, inside the extreme scenarios, which is something that is relatively um, expected based on uh, how these uh, temperature variations uh, change in space. And then that brings us also to, to the last part. It has to do with the recovery of the field. So how long does it take if we produce this, this hypothetical reservoir for 50 years, how long does it take for it to recover 
uh, and here we're looking at the at the production um, well to recover at the 99% uh, temperature level compared to where it started. We use this 99 because that last 1% might take really a very long time. Um, so we produce for 50 years at these three different uh, rates uh, of um, 100 uh, and up to 250, I think, and uh, then we stop at 50 years of production and we let the conductive recharge uh, take place. So what we see is um, in the extreme scenario, we have a lo longer um, recovery time. And uh, that is that has a few reasons that it happens compared to, for instance, the, the medium scenario. So in the medium scenario, you also have a higher, all the other layers are also higher, higher have higher uh, thermal conductivity values. And that means that the thermal recharge is not only coming from below where the salt is positioned, but also from um, laterally from, from the reservoir and also from the top. So that's why we see this, um, this earlier uh, recovery. And for the not salt scenario, this is simply because um, we are here, we, we experience a lower temperature drop. So therefore the recovery happens slightly faster. But all in all, you see that uh, in these extreme and medium scenarios, you have higher production temperature, uh, sorry, higher power output of the system, but also a very an, uh, relatively low penalty in terms of uh, recovery time compared to, let's say, the, the base case. So after that, we, we just uh, thought, okay, let's look into the locations where this could be applicable for the Netherlands, where we had uh, the data available. And you see here the thickness, the thickness of the salt layers throughout the country. And of course, in this um, northeastern part, where also the Hungarian gas field is located, there's a lot of uh, locations where uh, this thick doming exists. We have to keep in mind, though, that uh, it's not enough that um, you know, the domes are there. You also need to have the demand for geothermal energy. And also, you need to have a suitable aquifer that is positioned like uh, favorably or close to to the to a salt body to produce from. This brings me to the conclusions already of this work. Um, so we observed these temperature anomalies around salt structures, and we saw that 600 meters thickness is sufficient to already have a noticeable effect. Uh, we saw that these anomalies are a function of both the thickness but also the shape of the dome. So depending on how the dome shapes from its base to its top. Uh, also re, um, results in different distribution of the temperature around them. And we saw temperature differences of uh, 17 to 25 degrees that are equivalent to about 500 to 600 meters of drilling depth in this uh, geological uh, context. Uh, as a proof of concept, we also showed that uh, you could produce 40% more energy um, with a 30% longer recovery time um, if you have, if you use this uh, this increased heat conductivity of the salt, and uh, so that means that if we have a thick enough salt and an aquifer present, this could be an interesting target for for geothermal. Um, some reflection to this because this is work that I already it's already at least four years since uh, it was concluded. So a few things that I think personally I would do differently if I would start this today is I would start with the heat flow instead of the temperature uh, as, a, as a boundary condition, uh, simply because that uh, allows you for better, allows for better calibration of how temperature redistributes through the layers. Um, moreover, I think uh, the development options could be different because um, right now, the way it was carried out, it was not a one-to-one -one comparison. And by that, I mean, you don't have always the same starting temperature and you don't always produce to the same stopping temperature. You just do the same amount of years and that might not always be a fair comparison. And another point to consider is that, of course, if you produce something that close to salt, you have to wonder about the chemical implications. So if salt is present in the formation right above it or is leached to there through, through the production, uh, that might have implications to, to your system that need to be considered. And of course, um, we didn't substantiate further, but uh, it could be possible um, also with uh, progress that we've done in this um, domain in, over the years to further substantiate the economic benefits of a, of a system like that. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and um, open the floor to any questions you might have.
Thank you. All right, thank you, Alexandros. This is uh, Tim Shin here. I really appreciate your uh, your talk here. I I personally learned a lot, and uh, it's one of uh, the most interesting talks I've I've attended so far. So thank you very much. Um, right now it is uh, the thirty eighth minute, so we do have time for questions, and uh, we have a couple of opening questions so far. So I'll I'll go ahead and get started with those. So Wayne Camp asks, well, mentions that he's glad to see economic analysis done for geothermal. Is a 50 year well life reasonable? Are there any concerns with induced seismicity due to subsurface water injection? Okay, yeah. Uh, thanks Wayne for the, for the um, question. I think that, um, 50 years, yeah, it would not be reasonable, I think, to assume that a, a well would stay producing for 50 years. Typically, what we consider in geothermal projects is around 30 years of, uh, of production. And historically, we don't really have too many examples of wells running longer than that. I mean, the oldest ones we know are in the Paris Basin. So, um, maybe 15 years is, is a, a long time indeed for, for well life. Having said that, that's not something that we looked into because it was not the focus of this. Um, regarding the induced seismicity, um, there is a, a big difference compared to uh, oil and gas uh, production uh, with uh, geothermal systems like this one. And that has to do with the fact that you are, you are volume neutral. So the volume you extract, typically you re-inject minus maybe some uh, precipitation you might have at the surface. So therefore, any, any concerns of induced seismicity, they have to do mostly with um, this uh, pressure regime changing around injection and production. But overall, you don't have, as you have in gas production, for example, depletion over time. Um, an important aspect is, of course, the, the temperature. Um, so recent studies have shown that um, the temperature effect actually is much higher than the, the pressure one when it comes to geothermal production. So this is a, a very actively developing field uh, also in the Netherlands because there's a lot of concern on induced seismicity for these things. So for this particular case, there is no analysis on that, but uh, there's I can provide some additional references where um, research in that direction is being carried out. Thanks. And, and as a follow-up question to that, Ramon Gonzalez asks, is the main assumption that you will inject on the same sand that you're producing from? Yes, that is uh, typically the main assumption. And uh, depending on the regulations, you very often are obliged to do that. So you have to return the water because you, you, you produce the water, but you, you don't want the water. You just want the heat that is in the water. So Typically, regulations dictate that you have to re-inject it back to where you got it from in the first place. So you cannot be re-injecting it in a different um, formation. You have to put it back to the same reservoir. Yes. Great. Um, Antonio Teixel asks, uh, he says, thanks for the excellent talk. How do other evaporitic rocks behave, such as gypsum? That's a good question. I, to be honest, I wouldn't know. Uh, but uh, in this case, we treat the whole salt stack as, as one homogeneous, well, let's say, in terms of heat conductivity homogeneous layer. I'm not really sure I have seen, I don't have a, a, a number in mind for, for gypsum in terms of uh, um, heat conductivity, but uh, gypsum would be maybe challenging also to, to flow through if it's, if it's present in the reservoir or close to the reservoir anyway. So, yeah. Great. Mike Hudek asks, has anyone calculated the economics of geothermal energy over much taller piercement di diapirs, such as those found in Germany? Um, I know that uh, regional models in Germany have uh, looked into at least a the thermal effect of uh, the salt domes, but I'm not really sure if the um, economic uh, aspects of that have been uh, calculated to detail. Um, I can say that uh, at U Delft, um, we are working a lot on this economic assessment and we are developing a, 
probabilistic uh, uncertain quantification uh, platform for economic assessment of geothermal systems. So that will be something that we can look into um, in the future. And this direction with the salt domes, I have to admit that uh, I haven't picked up since the work that uh, I presented here. Great, thank you. Uh, so uh, Dr. Helen Doran asks, how important is the aquifer flow rate in terms of thermal recharge? Does it have to be dynamic? Um, I'm not really sure I understand that question. Maybe Dr. Helen can, can elaborate. Uh, if I, I might, um, so the faster you flow, the more you cool down. So it's a bit of a, of a complicated uh, question to answer because it depends on a lot of things. One of the things is, for example, what is your production interval thickness? Uh, is it homogeneous or not? Is it heterogeneous and to what extent and so on? So um, I'm not really sure I understand the question, does it have to be dynamic? Um, maybe if, uh, if they can elaborate on that, we can discuss it a bit more. Uh, yeah, that's uh, Dr. Helen Doran. If you're still there, please go ahead and elaborate in uh, either the chat or the question and answer. Uh, and I guess we'll come back to that when 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 you're ready. So, uh, Walt Horst Harston asks or mentions that this is a fascinating take for a geothermal source. You mentioned implications are producing from brine reservoirs. Has modeling shown the rate of salt scaling within the reservoir as you drop the temperature? Does that also have implications for reservoir durability? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so typically uh, most geothermal waters are not, uh, you know, are not demineralized. You have heavy brines down there and you have also very, very often a high salt concentration. So um, the scaling is, a, is something that is encountered very often. And it's, it's um, especially affecting the injector wells because there you have also lower temperatures. So you typically have a precipitation of, um, of scale that reduces your borehole diameter uh, as you drop temperature. So this is usually treated with, uh, with inhibitors that uh, stop scaling. And you might also consider to, um, for example, uh, increase the, the pressure of the surface facilities to, to reduce that effect by not allowing, making it less favorable for, for um, salts to precipitate. Um, regarding reservoir durability, I think it doesn't have such a big effect because you, you would inject back what you, what you produced. Uh, except for the parts that uh, precipitate at surface. So you're not introducing something that was not there. Having said that, if, um, if you have other aspects such as degassing at surface, in some cases you have dissolved gas produced with the water that might change the pH, and then you're looking at a, at a slightly different problem. Uh, all in all, you need to really consider the, the geochemistry of, of your whole cycle when you're producing. And, and that also links to the previous uh, question about induced seismicity. And that's something that we look at at, at TU Delft, how, for example, using different inhibitors that solves my, one problem might actually create another one in terms of uh, uh, fault stability if you encounter any faults with your, with your cold plume. Great. And sort of, I think, as a related follow-up question, Nora Coltzer says, thank you for the interesting talk. What is the effect of hydrodynamics in the vicinity of the salt dome? Is it complicated to inject water without being concerned about the dissolution of the salts? Yeah, so I think, yeah, indeed a really good question. I think it's not, um, it's not easy to, you cannot uh, assume that you will not have dissolution of salts. Probably you will. And uh, we also know that uh, formations that are close to the salt oftentimes have um, uh, some, they have increased um, salt um, in, in their pores 
through to leaching or through to maybe circulation that is already in place. So indeed, that that is something that needs to be to, needs to be considered. It's just that uh, as a proof of principle, we just wanted to see if this is if this is interesting. I, I cannot answer that question to be honest because I have not done the the geochemical analysis, but that would be something necessary before this uh, becomes a, a real thing. Yeah. Great. Thanks. And and something that. You know, we have another kind of question here, and I think it's along the same lines of what you, the topics you've just been mentioning here. From Carla Skinner, I've been thinking about this. Are I don't know if you're aware of um, some newer closed loop style systems for geothermal, such as Ever, uh, uh, and other uh, experimental technologies. How do you think the models would change if? this was in a closed loop system such as an ever style well yeah i think that that's a really interesting question so i think that um, because there you have a benefit in term in the sense that you control your loop chemically and pressure and everything but you have maybe limited heat exchange compared to if you had contact through the reservoir so I'm not really sure where the balance to strike there is in terms of, of, of rates or length of the of your of your loop and so on. But definitely in this in this type of the system, that would be a, an interesting uh, like li leaving aside, let's say that the complexity of drilling through salt to or close to it. Um, I think that would be an interesting concept. I do know that um, there's a close type type systems like borehole heat exchangers, which are basically use the well as a, as a, as a heat exchanger, but you don't um, um, flow inside the reservoir, have already shown interest for uh, locations in the north of the Netherlands where you have these domes coming closer to the surface. So to, to position these borehole heat exchangers at the top or close to the dome should have a, a positive effect, but I have not seen that uh, quantified. And, uh, you know, I, I've been wondering, have you seen this applied actually anywhere in the world for geothermal production or, or testing? Of no, I have not. Uh, it could be that uh, such a concept exists or a project like that exists. I know that for the borehole heat exchangers, they were interested to have a pilot on this. I'm not sure where that is at the moment, but um, let's say for, for interacting also with the reservoir, I have not yet seen. Um, maybe this talk uh, helps uh, spark more interest in it again. And, and, and uh, you know, another question I've had is, have, had you gotten a chance to sort of catalog the places on the planet, these various salt basins where the heat flow is high enough in the pre-salt section to, to make interesting geothermal objects or tests? Uh, the simple answer to that is, is no. So we did that. The scope was a bit uh, focused on, on the Netherlands, but I'm maybe in, in your community, you have a better uh, overview of maybe mapping salt structures around the world. So we could, uh, we could maybe explore that together. Yeah, you hear that? If anybody is interesting, pl interested, please contact Alexandros. Uh, I see some people are asking for yeah. the, for the paper. I can add the link here, and it should be okay. should be open access for everybody to to download. Great. I was I was just about to do the same, but yes, thank you. If you could, there you go, everybody. The link for Alexandra's paper. It's open access. It's on sciencedirect.com. It's in our chat there. Um, so please go ahead and download it. I've downloaded it numerous uh, times and sent it off to people who I know are interested in geothermal and uh, it's quite accessible. So I think with that, if there are no more questions from the audience, I'd like to thank you, Alexandros, for your time and for presenting to the APG Salt Basins community. We've had uh, almost 100 attendees today. Uh, so very, very well attended several people have been very interested in your work and so we're, we're uh, very thankful for you presenting uh, for the rest of you uh, you can join us on our our, uh, our next apg salt basins talk which is next tuesday december 7th with tim dooley of ut austin uh, bureau of economic geology
There he will be talking about physical modeling of uh, salt diapers. And I've got the title right here. Just let me get to it real quick. It's the growth and evolution of salt canopies on salt detached slope on a salt detached slope insights from physical models. So uh, go ahead and, and find us. Uh, Connor, I don't know if you've got the links for ready for, for signing up for APG Salt Basins webinar to get uh, emails. Also, this talk has been recorded uh, and will be uploaded to YouTube as soon as we get the okay from Alexandros and, and everything is uh, ready to go. Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to say, if I may, that uh, if you have further interest in this or you're considering to, to, to do some additional work in this direction, don't hesitate to contact me. I will be very happy to be involved. And thanks again for the, for the invitation to present here today. Great, thank you so much. I, I, yeah, it was an excellent talk, Alexandros. Thanks a lot. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Yeah, I know there's some geothermal folks in here that I know personally in this in this chat. So go ahead and contact him. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Excellent. Uh, regarding next week's talk, if you're if you're registered for this one, you should get the email reminder. It's the same registration link. But as ever, we'll be posting in the in the lead up. So keep an eye on Twitter, keep an eye on LinkedIn, keep an eye on Facebook, wherever you get your salt basins goodness, you should get a link uh, over the weekend and early next week ahead of the talk. Fantastic. All right. Done. Very cool. Really appreciate it. That was a, that was a lot of fun to, to yeah. 